It's Saturday night. It's almost live. And it's right up a big tower in London's Westminster. It's John Prescott's News Thing. That's right. With Sam taking a well-earned break in Cincinnati, tonight's guest host is Britain's favorite deputy, John Prescott. This week, helping John punch the news in the face for throwing an egg, it's Felicity Ward. Taking a taxi a hundred yards up the road so her hair stays nice, it's Susie Boniface. And he also started his career surrounded by semen, it's no Jags, Bobby Mayer. Coming up, if you thought the EU debate was dreary, technical, and long-winded before, brace yourself, oh, here comes Corbin. Never mind gorillas in the mist, here's one gorilla who wishes they'd missed. And tonight's special guest, at least he made the trains run on time, it's former mayor of London, Ken Livingstone. Hi, welcome to the show. Now I know what you're thinking, Sam Delaney smartened himself up for a bit, but I'm not Sam, I'm John Prescott, and this is my news thing. Thanks for joining me, panel. Now's the time to talk about the EU. Wait, stop, put the remote control down, it's me. It's going to be more interesting with a bit of humour and no more talk about facts. For too long now, the European Union debate has been split between two camps. One on the one hand is a bunch of Tories who don't want foreigners in this country. On the other hand, a bunch of Tories who want foreigners in, but only if they work as nannies. You'll notice the one side are barely heard from, and certainly not reported, is my lot, Labour. But this week, Jeremy Corbyn stated Labour's views without standing next to a Tory. Although if you saw his speech, not much passion. The threat to the British people is not the European Union. It's a Conservative government here in Britain seeking to undermine many of the good things that unions and other people have achieved in Europe and resisting changes that would benefit ordinary people in this country. I'd show you more, but your TV would automatically go into standby. Jeremy said there is an overwhelming case for staying in, and I agree with him. But that was the only time overwhelming is going to be used to describe that speech. Some of these things he's been saying for months, but only now is it being reported. I'm bound to say it looks to me like some of his advisers have made a conscious decision to sit back and say nothing about Europe in the hope that the Tories will continue to self-destruct. Look, no one enjoys watching Tories tear themselves apart more than me. Up till now, most Labour voters complain they don't know where Labour stands. But I'll tell you where they have been standing. Too near the bloody Tories. The new mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, has been out campaigning alongside David Cameron, which ironically means that David Cameron is right. Sadiq Khan really does share a platform with extremists. <laughs> the Tories don't want the Europe that Labour wants. The Tories are absolutely and fundamentally against workers' rights and human rights. They're our values, not theirs. We've got a job to do, an important job. Labour needs to be out there campaigning as hard as hell to keep Britain in Europe. You know, the modern world is about global power. China, America, India, Russia. Why would be in Britain's interest to remove itself from our global power, Europe? And if you want to take on the big global problems with global solutions over the coming years, security, terrorism, food, production, environment, and yes, global migration and refugees, these issues will be sorted out by major global powers, not a tiny isolated island who have opted out. Panel, who wants to step up and disagree with me? Disagree with you about what? About <laughs> Jeremy or what Labour are up to? Or whatever you want. What's happened, quite plainly, is that uh, the Tories are having their once a decade ritual self disembowelment over the European Union. And Labour have, as you've rightly said, made a very cynical decision to let them get on with it. The issue is going to be, at the end of the day, whether when the Tories are nothing but a bunch of 
uh, twitching lumps of gristle left on the floor, they're still more electable than Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. Well, I hope you're wrong about that, but it's certainly that fear people have. But I agree with you. Get your act together. Let people know what we stand for and talk about our values instead of the issues at the moment, whether you believe in X or Y or how many numbers. What do you think about it then, Bobby? I think he, if he just had some passion, like, does this guy ever get excited? Can't he just channel, like, the yeah, like, but when you a, a look blow at job it. he got 15 years ago to get a smile on his fucking oh, face? Oh, my like, head. Like, this is seriously... <laughs> you're a mascot for a country. You're the leader. You're like a mascot. You don't have to be the smartest guy. That's why your advice is. You just need to be the face of a fucking party. Yeah, but I want to ask you out of that. I understand what you're saying, Bobby, but when you look at him and you look at Cameron, look at their two leaders at the moment. Cameron, you might say, is more passionate in his lying, whereas mm -hmm. Jeremy says things. Do you think Jeremy believes what he's saying and do you believe Cameron believes what he's saying? Neither of them believe what they're saying. And Corbyn voted out in the EU referendum in the 1970s and he's saying vote in this time if he doesn't argue more passionately about the EU and if we end up leaving the EU because Labour vote hasn't come out because they think the Labour Party doesn't have an opinion uh, th about that, this. That's interesting but Felicity you're listening to this at the moment and we're talking about one character is clearly a lot more people think that if he doesn't say it passionately, at least he believes it. With in political life at the moment there's a great deal of doubt if you get emotional you're not actually saying what you believe. Jeremy does. Do you think that? I, I absolutely believe that he he says uh, what he that he believes what he says. And I don't think that so many people would have signed up to join the Labor Party as members um, if, he, if he didn't represent values that speak to people. But he doesn't, he doesn't speak with any passion. And I, I'm one of the people that joined the Labor Party because of him. And I'm still going, come on, Jez. I need you to give me a raise the roof. Give me something. Because what's happening now is the same thing that's been happening in Australian politics for about seven years, which uh, the voters are playing a well, game... Well, they certainly get excited there. We get so excited, but now we're just playing a game which is which party is the in the least amount well, of shit? Let's assume then Jeremy keeps this character, that his integrity, which people feel about him. Can he win an election like that? I don't know. I don't know if he can. I want him to, but I don't know if he can at this point. He can definitely cure my insomnia. There's no Bobby. way he will ever win an election. <laughs> what are we talking about? If, if this guy right now was running against Ken Livingston's hero Hitler, the country would be like, well, this Hitler guy seems to care a lot more about what he's talking about. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Now, Bobby, it's time for one of your videotaped inserts. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it. It says here. Weird Shit with Bobby Mayer. A chemistry professor at the University of North Texas has invented a drug-sniffing car capable of detecting trace amounts of drugs in the air and then pinpointing their exact location on a map. They're using this technology to fight drugs. What a fucking waste. Do you know how many hours I've spent wandering around London looking to score? This could be the Uber of drug dealers. Hey kid, take the next left. I know a guy at Cold Harbor Lane. Nah, I can smell that shit from here, bruv. It's cut off fuck with baby laxative. You'll be on that shit out all night, bruv. I'll sniff out some shit that's gonna get us bare chung, you get me? Good work, kid. The real victims here will be the sniffer dogs who will be out of a job. They'll have to eke out a living licking peanut butter out of strangers' assholes, all the while sobbing, I used to be somebody, man. A vegan cafe in Georgia came under attack by pro-meat protesters who threw burgers and fish fingers at diners while they were eating. Police have released an e-fit of the ringleaders thought to be responsible. Who gets militant about anti-veganism? I found a YouTube video from a user who calls himself Alpi Eater, and he has a chilling message to all vegans. You dirty soy-eating bastards. A rain's coming, a rain of streaky bacon and fucking sausages. Have the daddies ready, cos I'm gonna bring you a full English you will never fucking forget. The protesters involved in the meat attack have been described as neo-Nazis. Hey idiots, Hitler was a vegetarian, and if he had lived, he would have brought out his own range of meat-free foods. Some moron
Vaughn trying to bring kids to Christ has translated all 66 books of the King James Bible using emojis. Great! Another reason to reject the Word of God. It's supposed to appeal to millennials whose attention span is low enough to classify them as retarded. But it's cryptic and confusing and you have to decipher it like it's fucking catchphrase. I'll sum up the Bible for you. Don't be gay. I've got an idea for an emoji. How about a gay guy crying next to a sewn up asshole? There, that's the fucking Bible. Thanks Bobby, that's pretty powerful stuff. Does it pay you for that? <laughs> Time now to look at the latest reality series produced by Vice News. It's taken the internet by storm. It's no holes barred behind the scenes looking at the life of Jeremy Corbyn. Apparently the documentary crew followed him around for eight weeks. Eight weeks with Jeremy Corbyn. I sat next to him on the train for three hours once. It got so bad I had to go back and sit in the second class. But at least it gives the public a chance to see the real Jeremy. A basic, decent guy. We found out what's in his heart, what's in his head, and even what's in the lunchbox. Sandwich. <laughs> Huh? Little sandwich. No, hot cross buns. Oh, very good. Whoa, fancy. Next thing you know, it'll be those bleeding croissants. Mind you, Easter is a good time to remember the bearded pacifist called JC, who eventually got crucified. <laughs> Speaking of which, let's have a look at how Jeremy deals with the attacks by the press. After an article in The Guardian criticised him for tolerating anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Labour has a problem with anti-Semitism under Corbyn. Ab utterly disgusting, subliminal nastiness. Oh, well, he took that well. <laughs> but as the leader of the Labour Party, he must be prepared to see this kind of attention. Uh, he's not a good guy at all. Um, but he's kind of, he seems kind of obsessed with me, you know? So one article about Jeremy Corbyn means the media are obsessed with Jeremy Corbyn. That's like watching Bake Off and complaining it's all about the cake. <laughs> but he does have his fans. When we want to give another name to Jeremy Corbyn, we should name him Integrity Jeremy Corbyn. I've got an Integrity Corbyn. It's the best trouser press I've ever owned. <laughs> you know, back in my day, politicians had proper names. The Iron Lady, Paddy Pants Down, and the best of all, Two Jags. There's some even have a rhyming nickname, Jeremy Hunt, but I'm not going down that way. <laughs> anyway, you can find this in a documentary on YouTube, and it's really worth 10 minutes of your time. It's actually 30 minutes long, but it's worth 10. Are you excited by Jeremy Corbyn, Felicity? Uh, look, the most impressive thing about that documentary is actually just after that scene where a near 70-year-old is on a smartphone and didn't it finish the sentence with, well, how do you turn this thing off then? He was very, very confident with technology and I think that's, that's a, a sure sign in the good direction. It was a good film, then, you think? I thought some of it. Yes, as you said, I got through 15 minutes of it and that was definitely 15 minutes. Um, so how would you feel? Is Jeremy cut out for television? I don't look. I was thinking about it and I'm like, he, it's very clear that he has very different leadership skills to Ed Miliband. Uh, for one, he wears a hat. That's actually all I could come up with. The, um, the interesting thing about that Vice documentary is that it was, um, start, it was being run by a journalist who was a Labour Party member who had voted for Jeremy to the opposition and uh, the leader of the opposition and who had started out being very favourable. And by the end of it, Jeremy hated him so much he was ripping off his microphone and refusing to talk to him any further. So which just goes to show the problem that Jeremy's got getting his message across via any form of media, mainstream or otherwise. Well, Bobby, with your colourful views, do you think he should get somebody else to stand in for him on television or just... I think I'd be a good stand in. I thought you were him when I first saw you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I have the the, the, the charm he lacks. When people talk to me oh, <laughs> yeah. say, people... say a charming statement, I've heard one, yeah. You're a good T V host. <laughs> He's a good liar too, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. it's fantastic. He'd no, be great as leader of the Labour Party. I, we should get Bobby to do I'd it. I'd even like shave my beard and uh, put on a, a, a suit. We're all experienced in, in images, right? Is the BBC really uh, involved in trying to shape that image in what they think of Corbyn? No. 
come on, it's the BBC. And if the BBC are getting attacked by the Tories for being biased and yeah. by the Labour Party for being biased, they're probably doing their job properly. Yeah, that's what all these BBCs and, relied yeah, on. Mind you, I'm not criticising the BBC. I think the great job and they're playing a part there. Though even journalists have views and they do shape them into their views that are presented. No. Certainly about your. No. Yes, no, yes. I don't believe it. <laughs> don't lie to me. Hey, did you, did you see the bit, uh, you know, OK, the bit of the documentary where George Osborne holds out the red briefcase where he presents the budget? Is that something that he does every year? Yeah. No, he does it every fortnight because he changes. You know, did ever hear the story then uh, about a mole in the office of Corbyn actually releasing all the information in ahead of Prime Minister's questions? Do you think that was right? Well... They've done that for years, John. You know this. They've done it on both sides. Have had leaks from the other side before Prime Minister's question. They couldn't get it from me because they can't understand my language. I can't speak English no, properly. No, there was no point getting a leak from you because <laughs> it was just gobbledygook. <laughs> right. Thanks, panel. Coming up, a huge crowd saw a gorilla shot dead in the Cincinnati Zoo. When I went to Chester Zoo to see a gorilla as a lad, we only got a balloon and an ice cream. And we've got a Labour politician who's repeatedly slagged me off in public. I know what you're thinking. That could be any of them. Fair point. It's Ken Livingston. <music> Welcome back. This week, there was a shooting in America. I know, what a surprise. Basically, there was a young black lad in a place he shouldn't have been. And amazingly, he wasn't the one that got shot. <laughs> Christ, Madagascar 4. Looks a bit dark. The gorilla was called Harama Bay, which is Swahili for working together. Fitting name, as everybody did indeed all work together to shoot the bugger. Through the head. They haven't got a film of the gorilla being shot, but it must have looked a bit like this. <laughs> Predictably, Twitter went mad. Well, madder than usual. A lot of people said they should have tranquilised the gorilla. Some people were blaming the mother. Others were calling for the zoo to be shut down. But let's face it, it wasn't a problem caused by the gorilla. This problem was caused entirely by humans. If a four-year-old kid can climb over your security fences in three seconds, then your security fences aren't secure enough. I feel for the lad. I know what it's like to be dragged around against your will by a furious gorilla. I've been on the campaign trail with Gordon Brown. Uh, sorry, Gordon, joke. Actually, I like gorillas. After all, experts say we share 97% of our DNA in common with them. And in some cases, 98%. <laughs> That's not fair. So, panel, <laughs> say it was up to you. Would you have pulled the trigger? Of course you would. Of course you would. If the gorilla's got your child, would you shoot it? Yes, you would. But the issue is not whether it's the gorilla's fault, because of course it wasn't. It's the fault of all the stupid human beings who firstly put a gorilla in a zoo, mm -hmm. who secondly built a security fence that was knee-high, consisted of one little rail, and who thirdly, once the boy did fall in, started screaming and yelling at the gorilla, which is what made him, as we just saw in that VT, so drag the boy around. It's stupid humans. But they were all there on the telephones filming it, weren't they? And it was an act of entertainment rather than tragedy. Yeah. What did you think about that, Felicity? Yeah, I thought the same thing. There's a, there, like, there was some articles saying, oh, you know, experts say that the gorilla was actually protecting the boy. I'm like, from what? Ever seeing his mother again? Like, there's other experts that say that he was definitely about to attack him. Have you ever been attacked by a dangerous animal? I, well, weirdly, I was in South Africa last year and there was a water buffalo that was about to break into the village that we were staying in and there was another um, truck that was blocking the fence and everyone in our car was stood up with video cameras going, oh, God, it looks so dangerous. I'm like, ah, oh, hello, they're about to fucking die. <laughs> like, maybe put your cameras down and maybe see what you can do to help. They're like, no, no, they'll be fine. There's experts. It reminds me of being, going to Chester Zoo where they were giving me an award for a campaign to be able to save the tiger. So they said, who do you want to be photographed? And I said, not a gorilla or a monkey. You can see what I'm pressed to do with that. So they picked an elephant. And this elephant walked across 
damp in his feet and his big trunk. Now, I never knew that. It stroked its uh, trunk right down my new suit. It's not at the end of that. It's not dry. It turned my suit into a slimy suit. That was my experience of that. But what I worried about most was his feet were going like that. I thought, it's going to bring it right down on my foot. Yeah. And all the photographers from the press were saying, another photo, John? What they wanted to see that elephant put it down on my foot. That was my experience of an animal, a lovable animal, but they're all dangerous in many ways. Hmm. Yeah, if I'm, ever in a, if I'm ever near a gorilla, shoot the gorilla. Don't leave it up to chance. How would to be they like, know? Shoot, I, they look I do not look like a gorilla, John. I look like an orangutan. I look like an orangutan. Totally different. Oh, orangutan. Totally different. You look like a gorilla, John. You're the gorilla man. I'm the orangutan. Yeah, you orangutan. Do do but don't show your ass on air. But leaving that aside, <laughs> panel, thank you very much for your contribution. There now follows a message from the Right Honourable Jeremy Corbyn. Good evening. My name is Jeremy Corbyn. I'm the leader of the Labour Party. That's right. I'm the fucking leader. Get used to it. I knew I shouldn't have had a drink with John Prescott the night before. It was 1983 and I was hung over down at Greenham Common. There it was. Womanhood in all its glory. A noble sight. Mothers, sisters, wives and lesbians. <laughs> and not the nice lipstick type, I can tell you. Sisters, I come in peace, I said. As I removed my knapsack, a crumpled copy of Razzle hit the ground, opening on a full hamburger shot of the lovely Joanne Guest. Arse, tits, fanny, the lot. You could see what she'd had for breakfast. Oh, it was lovely. But the sisters begged to differ. Even a hungover version of the red flag didn't stop them kicking my teeth in on the ground. Oh, that John Prescott, up to his pranks again. Still, you live and learn. Time now for my special guest. An embarrassment. Retire. You've had your turn. You've screwed it up. I'm not saying that about my guest. That's what he said about me. <laughs> Welcome to News Thing, the oh, controversial right. Ken Livingston. Me controversial? God blimey, you certainly are. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're not a man of controversy. I think I'd like to have a little bit myself. We say what we think. But I begin to wonder that some of your controversy is more about Ken than it is about the circumstances. <laughs> Let me give you an example, because yeah. I'd like to hear your view about it, Ken. All this thing that we've had about anti-Semitism, mm. right? You made that very mm. uh, controversial remark. But I know you, Ken. You'll have researched it. Whether Hitler mm. said it or not, you'd have done I'm your really work. Boring, like <laughs> yeah. that, yes. But Ken, you know how the press will react to that. You know the controversy mm. it will cause. It was very damaging for Labour. Even your mate had to suspend you while we look at it in the Labour Party. You know that, Ken. Why do you do it? Is it the controversy for you, or, or you ignore the damaging yeah. it can cause? I mean, literally, we've known for years, I mean, that there was a formal uh, pact agreed between uh, Hitler's government and the Zionists. It moved 66,000 German Jews to uh, Palestine. If they hadn't moved them, they'd have died in the gas oven. Yeah, so I, a lot I, of I said that. But it's true. It may, well, no, no. But I'm not arguing about yeah. that. You must have known what the reaction no. would be. No. I'm doing an interview. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing an interview about, I'm challenging this crap about Labour Party doing and said, I'm asked by the BBC interviewer, uh, is what Hitler did legal? I give a simple 40 word answer and move on. Oh. And then all these ghastly old ex Blair and, and writers start to screaming. find the reaction. Come on, Ken. Well, hang on. Say, we we've said, known each other no, for no, years. No, but you we, knew that would be controversial. No, My I question didn't. is, I mean, what did Jeremy say to you? No, he had you in. No, but no, Je you see, this is the thing. Jeremy didn't suspend me. It's that bureaucracy that Tony Blair created. <laughs> what did Jeremy say to you? Because he must have agreed it was perhaps a bit hitting the no, Labour no, no. Party. My, my conversations with Jeremy are private. Thanks very much. Oh, you know Ken Livingston. Sorry, can't answer that question. <laughs> it's private. Ken, mm. you're the guy who says it if it's got to be said. Yes. I mean, what but, about Jeremy? Come on, what did he it, tell you? No, no I'm, I'm not talking about what Jeremy said. But he suspended you. No, Jeremy He's the leader didn't. of the party. No, the, the, this is the thing. This is Blair's legacy. He he gave the bureaucrats the power to suspend. What do you mean, you and I? We were on the executive together. Yeah. You call them the bureaucrats No, now. no, no. <laughs> we were elected. The bureaucrats are the people appointed. 
I mean, Jeremy, don't, remember... You mean they, his advisors? No, 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 his advisors. It's the... So you the, don't want to upset the, formal, the advisors? No, then. no, the formal staff who were appointed, yep. mainly in, in, in Blair's era, I, they're not elected. We, when we were on the NEC together, you had about one suspension a year. Now it's become an industry. Well, um, well I can. You know the other parts with militants and all that. Oh, yeah. That was when these same people who are advisors now mm. believed the Labour Party should be a different character than mm -hmm. under Blair. Mm. You think that yeah. as well, right? Now, that's the Momentum Group. Are you a member of that? And what oh, do you I'm, think about them? I'm a supporter of Momentum, and it's really good. What because they wanted to do? They want to get back to the democracy. Right. When you they and I joined get, the Labour okay, Party, it was a democracy where ordinary people... But Ken, had most of them were suspended then that. in that time. You know you no. were on the executive when we were suspending them. Yeah, but that, I'm not talking about the old trots in military. I'm talking about ordinary people had an influence in the Labour but Party. But aren't we talking about away. militant tendency? Pardon? Aren't we talking about the militant nah, tendency? No, they're very boring. I mean, mean I, I, when I joined the Labour Party... What does Party, that mean? I agree with them, but I don't want no, to no, say it. No, I didn't agree with them. <laughs> they were awful on issues like lesbians and gays and so on. I mean, I remember when I joined the Labour Party, someone from Middle said, come to one of our meetings. And I fell asleep. It was so boring. And I didn't go in anymore. Didn't you? What, to mm. Milton? No, you go to Momentum. Does that keep you bored? No, that's filled with this good ordinary people. people. No, no, they're not the same people. The militant people were a completely hard-line group of trots who I mean, were basically a disaster. They were never going to get okay. anywhere. And OK. They can discuss on that, Ken. Yeah. Let me ask you another yeah. one. I sat on the executive. Mm. You were running for mayor candidate. Yeah. And you made clear to the national executive we weren't going to have your manifesto decided by Labour. Yeah. And I disagreed. And when they brought your name forward, I actually said, I'm going to hold my nose because I don't <laughs> trust this bugger. You won't do what the party wants. Mm. So in that case, here was you. You get elected by the party. Mm. You tell them, the national executive of the party, not bureaucrats, mm. people elected mm. like me, that you wouldn't take any notice. That was about Ken Livingston mm. creating another controversy about what? No. Not the Labour Party. Controversy about Livingston mm. affecting the Labour Party. No. Blair changed the Labour Party. It wasn't a democracy anymore. It was all decided by Blair and the little coterie around him. And that's why... Hang on. They used to have the, uh, we used to have the boats at conference. We used to have also... Yeah, we used to. And then he stopped it. We used to decide policy at conference. Now all the conference no. turned into was a, a series of, you know, photo shoots for the, you know, the leadership saying what. Fine. They okay. But however it's decided mm. in a democratic yeah. way, it goes to conference. I understand yeah. what you mean when they set it off to the side to do yeah. conference changes. But that was a decision taken by the party. You always think what Kevin Livingston mm. wants, not the party. I'm just saying I'm a party man. Mm. You are, unless we kick you yeah. out. We're leaving that aside, Ken. Let me follow you another one on that. Sadiq Khan, was he right to go on campaigning with Cameron, who'd already called no, him next no. to being I mean, a terrorist? I mean, David Cameron's the most dishonest Prime Minister in my Absolutely. lifetime. And it's a we rich have a good to agreement <laughs> together then, Ken. <laughs> a rich field to choose from, one has to say. But no, I mean, literally, I think Jeremy's absolutely right not to stand there with, with, right with there. Cameron. Yeah. Yeah. You, you was he that. right then to do it as the London mayor? No, that was a mistake, but we all make mistakes. Ken, I've got to put that as a quote, <laughs> Ken Livingston this week. And again, it's about Ken Livingston, not the policy. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Thank it's again. been a great turn. And to the panel, Felicity Ward, Susie Boniface and Bobby Mayer. Sam's back next week, unless the Customs do their job properly when he gets back to Heathrow. Goodbye.